Um, but we are going to get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Sunrise Worcester's third and final day of Earth Day celebrations. Um, we've had multiple teach-ins and presentations throughout the three days of Digital Earth Day this week. Um, on April 22nd, we really focused on striking and storytelling. We heard some, some really great stories from people like the North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. Uh, yesterday, we had a day of divestment where multiple schools and universities around Worcester talked about their own divestment campaigns and it was a really good constructive conversation bringing all the Worcester schools together to, to sort of talk about their own successes and problems. Today we're really going to focus on political action, hearing from some politicians, um, hearing about some, some climate and policy experts, um, and this first stream from 12 to 1 is really going to be focused on the local level. Um, many people are probably aware that last September Worcester declared a climate emergency. Um, we haven't really heard much about what Worcester plans to do with this climate emergency declaration. So we thought what no better way to sort of help us achieve the next step than bringing in the climate mobilization. Um, we have Rebecca Harris here today, who is going to be doing an interactive training on what cities and towns can do once they declare a climate emergency. Uh, Rebecca is going to present from about 12 to 12.30. And following that, we are going to have um, a discussion with some local, state, and federal politicians. Uh, we have David LaBeouf, state representative from Worcester on the call. We have city council member, Councillor Rivera on the call as well. And um, Congressman Jim McGovern is gonna join us a little bit later. So just to give people a sense of the structure, Rebecca will go from about 12 to 12.30. And then um, we'd like to hear from Councillor Rivera first, if Councillor could speak for about 10 minutes, followed by David for about 10 minutes, and then ending with Congressman McGovern for about 10 minutes. And then we want to open it up to all the participants in the live stream to have a Q&A. Um, if people have funds or resources or material goods or toiletries or, or anything that they can donate, um, we've been really trying to highlight the need for people to donate to Mutual Aid Worcester or their own mutual aid in their own town or the Mass Redistribution Fund which is a group of grassroots organizations helping people in need in response to the coronavirus. Um, so without further ado, we are just going to pass it along right to Rebecca and she's gonna go right into her teaching. Great, thank you so much. I'm really excited to join all of you today for your um, Climate Strike live stream. Um, my name is Rebecca Harris. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the organizing director at Climate Mobilization Project. Climate Mobilization Project is an organization that's working to kick off an emergency speed whole society mobilization to respond to the climate emergency and to end greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2030. Um, we work with people like you in about 100 communities around the US and a handful in Canada as well, who are working to get their city government, their county government, or their state government to start a climate emergency and just transition program, um, to pass a climate emergency declaration, and to follow up um, by actually funding programs and creating policy changes um, to create a rapid just transition off fossil fuels. Um, and I'm just really excited and honored um, to be here with you to share a little bit about climate emergency declarations worldwide um, and also about our framework for what um, cities and counties can do after passing a climate emergency declaration as Worcester did. So just a little bit about the worldwide movement to pass climate emergency declarations. There's now almost 1,500 governments around the world that have declared climate emergency, just like Worcester. Um, and most of these are actually local city and county governments. Part of what this accomplishes, of course, is just getting us to recognize the emergency, 
raising awareness of the situation that we're in. Um, but at Climate Mobilization Project, we think that as important as that is, that's not enough. And we also need to push our city and county governments, hold them accountable for actually taking real action to respond to the climate emergency. And so that's a bit about what I'll be talking through today. In the US, many climate emergency declarations, including Worcester's, actually commit cities and counties to go reaching zero emissions by 2030, right? So saying that by 2030, we're gonna completely transition a town's economy community-wide so that we're no longer generating greenhouse gases. Um, and we think this is a really important goal, um, right? Because this is what sets us up to eventually restore a safe climate to eventually be able to draw down greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere through our land use um, and eventually be able to create a climate that's safe uh, for everyone worldwide, right? Because we, we know that the earth is already too hot for safety, it's already too hot for justice, and we think it's imperative that we move as quickly as possible um, to stop making the problem worse first and then to begin um, to begin repairing some of the damage that we've done. So next I'll talk a little bit about what a climate emergency program is. Um, we're seeing through climate emergency declarations, um, a growing move towards cities and counties taking steps to rebuild their economy, to reach zero emissions in 10 years or less to also work to create a just transition for communities and a just transition for workers. Um, and I know this is a value that Sunrise holds really dearly as well, right, um, with the work towards the Green New Deal. Um, and the idea that these new investments, whether they're being made at the local level or being made at the national level through a Green New Deal, um, can be a great opportunity for increasing equity, um, a great opportunity as well for making sure that workers in fossil fuel industries don't have to bear the costs of the transition away from fossil fuels. I also want to be clear that uh, just like I was talking about a bit earlier, a climate emergency declaration is a tool for setting the agenda. It's a tool that we can use because Worcester's um, officials as well as officials in other towns and counties worldwide have promised they're going to work towards uh, meeting the goal of zero emissions by 2030. Um, but just like any promise that an elected official makes, it's up to us as organizers, as community members, um, as concerned residents to hold them accountable to that promise um, and to really turn the rhetoric of a climate emergency declaration into reality. Um, and so today I'm going to be sharing a bit about, a little bit later, about some policy tools we can use to do just that. I also want to be clear about what a climate emergency program is not, right? Because in some cases, people may think they already have a climate emergency response going on in their city or in their town. Um, but the truth is that many towns have community climate action programs that may be tied to slower goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, that may be working more gradually that may be underfunded to the point that um, they're not working at the speed or the scale that we need them to work in order to uh, move us forward towards creating a safer climate. I also wanna be clear, a climate emergency program is different from the carbon fee and dividend approach. Um, there's a number of local governments as well as a push in Congress to pass carbon fee and dividend legislation. Um, and this is a slower approach that focuses mostly on the consumer demand side of addressing fossil fuels um, and doesn't address fossil fuel production, fossil fuel consumption. Um, so we wanna make sure that climate emergency response policy, whether it's at the city level, county level, state, or federal level, is working to address fossil fuel production and infrastructure. And I'll share more about how that's done and what that looks like in a minute. Also, climate emergency program is not just an effort to change individual behavior. Um, there's a lot that we can do as organizers 
uh, to create structural change. Um, and I think our the example we've seen with the response to coronavirus is actually a really good example of how it can make a huge difference in people's choices when the government, whether that's the city, county, or federal government, actually starts setting norms and start setting the tone for what we need to do to create a safe economy and a safe society, right? Just as many of us now know that we need to stay home to flatten the curve on coronavirus, we think that actually it should be the role of the government, um, whether at the local, county, or federal level, to um, start helping people be aware of the impact of their choices as consumers, in addition to making the policy changes that we need government at every level to make. Um, so we want to be clear that working to respond to the climate emergency is, a, through, through this approach, is different from um, the approach we sometimes see climate groups taking uh, of doing peer-to-peer -peer organizing uh, to get people to change their consumption behavior. Um, we believe that that work is going to be much more effective if it's actually coming from the government as part of an effort to shift us together into emergency mode. I'm going to share a little bit about what one city did after passing a climate emergency declaration in order to work towards responding to the climate emergency. Um, and this example comes to us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, Ann Arbor passed its climate emergency declaration right around the same time that Worcester did. Um, and um, Ann Arbor's declaration actually stipulated that the city's sustainability department was going to, within, um, I believe it was 90 days, uh, was going to, 90 or 120 days, was going to come up with a plan for eliminating Ann Arbor's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. So at the end of March, um, Ann Arbor's sustainability department in collaboration with about 60 organizations um, released, uh, released an Ann Arbor climate mobilization plan. Um, Ann Arbor's plan offers improved mass transit. It sets aside about $1 billion over the next 10 years to completely transition um, Ann Arbor almost completely transition Ann Arbor away from fossil fuels. Um, it includes plans for converting the transportation to electric power, um, setting a net zero energy standard for new buildings, uh, reducing waste, and also as part of that, transitioning Ann Arbor's electricity. So this is one example. Um, it is perhaps the best example of what a city has done after passing a climate emergency declaration. Um, and what's really key to me about Ann Arbor's work is um, the level of involvement, um, the level of intentionality, the level of planning, right? And that the city um, sought buy-in, sought support from dozens of organizations um, in order to come up with a plan, um, propose a plan that can transition the city completely away from fossil fuels over time. Now, um, I will just add, Ann Arbor's plan is not perfect. Um, the plan actually reduces greenhouse gas emissions just by 85% by 2030 and relies on offsets for the last 15% of emissions. Um, so that's um, something that's a challenge with the plan. Um, we believe that cities should be striving for zero to negative emissions within their city without relying on offsets. Um, but it is one of the strongest um, steps that we steps forward um, that we have seen by a city after passing a climate emergency declaration and it begins to give us some sense of the scale and, and the scope of the planning um, that we think are necessary and the amount of facets of city or, or town life um, that a climate emergency response will touch. So I'm going to share uh, a bit about what we think is the best way to move forward based on our experience supporting climate emergency campaigns around the U.S. after passing a declaration. First, uh, we think one of the most important things that can happen after passing a climate emergency declaration is organizing, continuing with the coalition building efforts, 
the base building and community involvement efforts that led to passing a declaration and working to hold city officials accountable. Because if there's one thing we've seen, it's that officials, unfortunately, sometimes like to uh, like to pass a declaration um, and get the credit for doing that without always putting in the hard work um, to implement it and come up with real policy. So after passing a declaration, continuing to organize, and keep the momentum up is one of the most important things that can be done. In terms of policy steps, what to push for. Um, one tool for um, thinking about what to push for after declaration is looking at the text of the declaration itself. Um, what sorts of community involvement was promised? Um, what actual benchmarks did the city promise uh, to meet? Um, and Worcester, as I'm sure many of you know, did pledge to reach zero emissions by the year 2030. So that's a baseline for holding them accountable. And another set of tools I'll share is what we like to call ban, plan, and expand. This is a three-pronged policy approach for what cities can do to move towards zero emissions after passing a climate emergency declaration. So ban refers to banning fossil fuel extraction and burning. Um, so this could refer to um, phasing out banning oil refinery operation. Um, this could refer to banning extraction. There are communities where fracking takes place, communities where oil drilling takes place um, that have instituted local bans on those activities and worked to get those shut down. In terms of banning fossil fuel burning, this could encompass everything from a city or a town working to um, get residents fully transitioned over to electric cars through subsidies, through incentives. Um, this could refer also to fully electrifying a town's buildings, replacing gas furnaces, gas stoves, gas water heaters with electric alternatives so that buildings aren't continuing to burn fracked gas and continuing to create those methane and carbon emissions. Plan is about creating a comprehensive plan for how a city or county is going to actually reach the zero emissions goal in the declaration, right? And Ann Arbor's plan is one example of that. Um, in some places, this is done through an appointed advisory council with additional public input. Um, in some places, it's done the way it was in Ann Arbor with the city working to create a coalition, meeting with, working with many, many different um, groups and organizations. Um, in other cases, this has been done, this has, has been proposed to be done, such as in Los Angeles with more um, direct democratic means. Um, in Los Angeles, neighborhood assemblies have been proposed. Um, another option is actually giving people um, pay time off, child care, support, time and space to study the climate emergency and propose their own solutions in a way that's actually similar to jury duty. Um, and this approach is called deliberative democracy. Um, and th that approach is one of the strongest ways to get public participation um, and public buy-in in a plan. The last prong of this is called expand. Um, expand refers to um, expanding the climate emergency push to other levels of government and also expanding public awareness, right? So we can think of this as the government itself becoming an advocate um, this can look like city officials talking to members of Congress, talking to state government officials, and urging them to respond to the climate emergency as well. This can also look like um, city officials running public service announcements um, to help people understand the seriousness of the climate emergency and what they can do to respond in their own lives. So, now that we have gone over some of these um, prongs, ban, plan, and expand, um, we're gonna just very quickly um, break out into groups. Um, there's gonna be three breakout groups, and we are gonna do a rapid brainstorming activity um, to come up with ban, 
policy ideas, ways to ban fossil fuel extraction and burning. Plan policy ideas, ways to create a broad community plan. And expand ideas, ways to expand public awareness, ways to um, move this push from Worcester to other levels of government. So group one is gonna be ban, group two is gonna be plan, and group three is going to be expand. And you're gonna have just two minutes in your breakout groups to come up with as many um, policy ideas as you can for each one. Um, and also just to clarify, you're gonna be coming up with things that the city government, the Worcester government could do. So things the Worcester government could do to ban fossil fuel extraction and burning, things the Worcester government could do um, to create a community planning process to, on how to reach zero emissions, and things the Worcester government could do to expand this push to other levels of government um, and to more people, get more people in Worcester engaged. Um, all right, so are we ready to go into breakout groups? Is everyone who's not in a breakout room right now, did you get a notification to join one?
Okay. <coughs> Hi, Congressman McGovern. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I'm Gwen. I'm one of the youth activists with Sunrise. Well, it's great to see you. And, and, um, is, is Senator Markey on this call with us or? He's not. Okay. So just me and, and whoever, right? Um, yep. And then we have a bunch of participants and then um, State Rep LeBeouf and uh, Councillor Rivera from Worcester. Okay, and do you want me to um, open up with a statement, or do you? Are you? Are we just going to discussion? You tell me. Um, so we're going to be finished. Everybody's in breakout rooms right now, um, yeah. and then when we come back, we're going to finish a presentation from the climate mobilization, um, and then we'll hop into um, statements after that. Oh, so, so you want me to give a statement and not just take questions, right? Yeah. So um, you'll be talking for about ten minutes. Okay, I got it. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. And um, they should be coming back from breakout rooms in probably around five minutes. Okay. 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 And I just wanted to let you know, we are live streamed on Facebook um, okay. and we're recording this as well. So we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, and then if you'd like to share any of it, you're more than welcome to. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I want to take a quick minute to say hi to Representative McGovern. So glad to see you. And Happy thanks to be for all you. you do for us, man. Well, thank you. I hope everybody's safe and healthy. <laughs> Jim, hey. it's Heidi Beertaller from Maine. We met in Massachusetts around Joe Mokley. Oh, boy, yeah. Hi, folks. Hello. I think we're all back in the main uh, meeting I room thank now. Thank you. I need to run. <laughs> okay. Good. Thanks Let's for go. joining us, Heidi. Um, I am really grateful for the conversation I heard in the breakout rooms, um, going around to hear some of the different um, ideas that were in play. Um, I would love to hear first from the BAN group. Uh, does anyone in the BAN group want to report back on some of the ideas you came up with around banning fossil fuel extraction and burning? Whoops, I think you're muted. Let me unmute you. Thank you. Um, the first thing we said was uh, to have an all electric public fleet, and that includes electric school buses, um, retrofit existing buildings to be energy uh, efficient. Um, Janet brought up a point to stop burning our waste and maybe using a burying method instead. Uh, any new building must meet energy efficiency standards. Uh, for public meetings, maybe shift to online a little bit more instead of in person, uh, and then uh, have more bicycle lanes in the city. I know there are a couple more points that I didn't get to write down. Uh, Paul, if you want to speak on those. Yeah, water conservation and um, um, <clears throat> again, renewable energy generation and the switch to electric sources for transportation and um, um, building heating, using heat pumps and other new technologies. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, and it's okay if we don't get every single one of the ideas, we just wanna get a sense. Unfortunately, we're a little bit over our allotted time. Uh, what about the plan group? Would you be able to quickly share back? Yeah, so um, we mentioned a couple things. One was the fare free initiative going on in Worcester to get public transportation fare free for everyone who rides it. Um, Peter mentioned the idea of victory gardens and really making those popularized again um, and really thinking about uh, project drawdown as a sort of frame for when we're thinking about our plans and solutions uh, for land, food and energy and such. Great. Thanks for sharing. What about the expand group? Anything you want to share? A is lot there, of our talk. Kind of, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of our talk focused on kind of like a regional, more regional approach, getting the uh, the surrounding towns involved in kind of a collaborative effort, uh, particularly with transportation, with energy, and uh, just all all the factors, so that it's not just Worcester doing it in isolation, and every you know, smaller town around Worcester doing their own thing. 
great. Thanks for sharing that. That definitely really gets at what expand means and what we're trying to do with this um, is, is getting other towns, other levels of government involved. So as we close out um, our short time together, I just want to share one resource, which is a handout we have called We Passed a Declaration. Now what? And I'm going to put it, a link into the chat. Um, I'm also going to put my email address into the chat box because I want to make sure we can keep this conversation going, in particular, if there's any questions that folks had that we weren't be able to get to. Um, and then I would love for those of us that have chat access, if we could all share in the chat box, um, maybe one takeaway from our conversation today um, and sort of one, uh, one action step, if there's anything you're thinking about that you're um, Call to do moving forward with Worcester's climate emergency declaration um, implementation. I'd love to see, you know, in the chat box, any any thought you have on your next step um, and any takeaway from our conversation, just briefly as we uh, transition into the next speaker. And uh, we can put those in the chat as we transition out. I'm happy to hand it over to the next person. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was that was really good. And I really enjoyed um, talking with some of the other people, some people I knew and some people I didn't know. So I think bringing people together um, will be really important as we as we really talk about the climate emergency declaration in Worcester. Um, so it's about 1238 and we're probably going to go over a little bit of the one o'clock time slot. Um, but I'm really excited to welcome all of our local politicians from a local state and federal level. Uh, I know some people just hopped onto the call, so what I'm going to ask from all of our elected officials who are going to talk, um, we're going to start with Councillor Rivera, then go into State Representative David LaBeouf and end with you, Representative McGovern. Uh, if you could all speak for about seven or eight minutes, that'd be perfect. And then uh, at the end of Representative McGovern's talk, um, we'll, we'll open it up for some question and answer. I'll ask that people put their questions in the chat just so we're not all talking over each other and me and Sunrise Worcester will really facilitate that. So if Councilor Rivera, Councilor Rivera if you're still available, if you wanna start, um, that'd be great. Yes, I just got back, I'm sorry. I may need to kind of jump off to, um, I just got some call, I'm dealing with a family in my district that three people in the family are COVID positive. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but anyways, um, I thank you so much for inviting me. And this is something that is really important. I think that one of the things that's really important is that I didn't want to just um, do this climate um, declaration and just leave it as that as some sort of feel good legislation, but that I really felt that we in Worcester are so, so good at organizing that we could actually really have some meat and bones to this. And um, so in September, we made that declaration. It was unanimous, which was great. Um, 11 to 0, which was really awesome. But now was about, okay, now what do we do? And so we started organizing um, with some of the local folks, um, some of the local organizations in Worcester. Um, and our goal was to try to develop like a plan that we can work. So one of our thoughts is actually taking something like what I did was like um, working for Worcester, um, you know, uh, Worcester Works, I'm sorry, that it was actually created, that we were looking at um, health and racial disparity, we were, I'm sorry, not health, racial disparity um, and economic development, and we had specific goals. So I wanted to look at what were those specific goals that we could actually mount up, that we could then measure after. Um, what is that for? You don't have one? Okay. Sorry. Um, so I think that what was said at the beginning is really looking at, is actually really looking at being able to actually do that. So um, we want to be able to kind of have some sort of a summit and set some goals and then being able to set exactly that, be able to say, okay, how does this look like if we were to measure this, how do we know we're actually doing something? How can we go back six months from now or a year from now and be able to say, wow, this climate, you know, doing this declaration really mattered. Um, I know that the, the city manager added a new, um, the, the city council added a new committee this year, which is on urban planning um, and um, kind of like um, 
and climate. So I think, and, and green. So I think that's really important. Um, that's actually a new subcommittee that was added to our council and it's being led by um, Councillor uh, Matt Wally. But also just wanna talk a little bit about, you know, our green plan. Um, we have, one of the things really important is really we're strongly committed to sustainability in Worcester and I really appreciate, I think our city manager has really heard um, the community very loud and clear. We have a number of different um, people um, in, in our community that is actually doing some really incredible work. Um, and part of that kind of those priorities, they did some surveys, um, but also Worcester sustainability accomplishments. I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, advocacy for climate change, action and more. We had um, we have different groups, whether it's 350 Central Mass or Mothers Out Front, just to name a few, and Walk Bike Worcester. Um, and so there's a number of community organizations and part of us, what I started doing with um, Juju and other folks is to organize some of these folks to see what are those next steps to put some kind of meat and bones behind it. Um, there's been a really strong con uh, commitment to blue space and I really wanna highlight the mayor's work on that. Um, climate change, preparedness and resilience work, electricity and community sustainability, energy efficiency, green space, um, one of the things that has been really, really important in the last, um, I would say, probably six years is our commitment to green space. Um, every single park in my district has had a renovation. Um, and one of the things that I really want to, especially now in COVID, like it's interesting that we've been talking about this, but like food sustainability, and we're seeing like the need for that while we're going through this crisis. But um, a good example of that was um, when there was a master plan um, in Maloney Field in South Worcester, but we saw that there was really, it was um, kind of a food desert in that area. And there was one of the areas that didn't have a community garden. So the community expressed their concerns. And so we started a community garden, but it was told to us um, that there was already a master plan for the park. And although we start a community garden, that it's most likely that it's gonna have to be um, taken down. However, um, what happened was that that community garden became so successful and so well done that the master plan was re um, was kind of re looked at, and um, and when the park was finished, they implemented the community garden within the master plan, and that was all because of communities doing. And it's an amazing community garden um, that's also accessible via. Um, um, it's also handicap accessible. It's very widely used, very diverse, and I think that that's really important. So continuing to support our green space art is is great. We have um, various solar projects, as we know, um, and we have updated. If you go to our green, if you type into what's called um, Green Worcester Plan, you'll see a lot of this information. I'm just going by it really quick for lack of um, time. But we also have um, today, Massachusetts has like 204 times as much solar capacity compared to 10 years ago. And Worcester has been an active contributor to the solar growth. In the last 10 years, more than 150 solar systems were installed in our city. Um, in the last six years, in 2011 and 17, the city installed what is now owned as the maintenance of 15 solar installations in the municipal property. So we've been using our municipal properties for this, which is great. Uh, totaling over 10.5 megawatts DC in solar capacity. So I think these are the things that we have to continue. Urban agriculture and healthy food access, as I just talked about, we want to continue to work on that. Um, and trees. Um, it's funny, my husband started calling me a tree hugger. Um, when I came, when I started in council, I'll be honest, like I love nature, but I really didn't understand the importance of trees and urban trees and trees in urban communities. And I was really fortunate to have people to come and teach me about, um, come and meet with me about the importance of trees in our community. And I learned so much about that and like the importance of it. And um, I wanna say that I think it's, you know, our tree initiative has been great. I still feel like there's a lot more we can do with our tree initiative. I think especially when we're doing new construction, I find that we're taking out trees and maybe in certain areas, we're not replacing the trees back. We still haven't gotten the full hang of that. And I think that's where we falter, but um, 
I think what would be great is that we did the, the emergency declaration on the 17th. And as we meet, unfortunately, we are all been kind of like halted because of COVID, which is why I was so excited that you all decided to do this today. And even in the midst of everything that's going on, I wanted to participate, even if it was part of the time, because I feel like I would love to have kind of like some measurable goals and present them to council, um, especially now, like as we're going through budget season, what's some things that are going to be costly for us and, and try to advocate for those things and say, okay, can we see that in six months, can we have these things completed? And in three months can we do this in 10 months a year from now so i would love to have some help in the and that's part of what the group is doing here in worcester of organizers and advocates to be able to develop that same thing so it's really about us together i didn't want it to just be something we did in september and forgot about it we had an opportunity to meet several times um and i'm really glad that we're you know that we are meeting today and actually moving forward because it is something um, that is really important. We're, we're getting to see the impact of like how we don't have the cars on the road and um, how we don't have planes flying everywhere and the, the positive impact that that has had on our environment. Um, and so it's interesting how you have people talking about um, the, the fuels and the impact and that this has had on the environment. So um, I think it's a really good opportunity, to, even in the midst of, I think we're all dealing with emergencies, but we can't forget that we still had a climate emergency that we needed to have a conversation about. And um, thank you very much for continuing this conversation. I wanna be able to continue to have some meat and bones to this and not just have something that was great that we all felt good about in September, but that we can continue and actually set goals and hold us accountable to that work. Thank you. Thank you, David, if you wanna start, that'd be great, thank you. All right, great. Well, again, thank you everybody for allowing me to be here with you all and to speak about um, these issues. So just to give you a, um, a little bit of perspective about what's going on at the state level. So um, from the House's perspective, we did pass a um, bill called the Greenworks Bill, uh, which it was more about um, remediation as opposed to um, you know, preventative measure, measures. Um, and the fact of the matter was it was supporting cities and towns to have sustainability coordinators um, to making sure that for individuals that had like seawall issues that there was proper support for that. Um, also for weak um, water and sewer systems, making sure that we had support for that. So the house did take some leadership on that. Um, another um, bill that I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of and supporting of is the 2050 Roadmap. Um, so I have a great colleague, uh, Joe Mischino, who's um, on the South Coast, really looking at how do we prepare the Commonwealth for a long-term um, climate impact. And I know a lot of our um, efforts that we've been talking about have been about 2030, um, but her bill is about 2050. And I know that uh, we do need to be prepared for the long-term solution. I know that we've got a little bit of different deadlines. Um, I know there was some conversation earlier regarding um, climate pricing. Um, I am a co-sponsor on a lot of those, those bills around um, making sure that we're having some carbon exchange. Um, but the 2050 roadmap has made its way throughout and I'm hoping that we can support that. Um, the other thing we just really need to, to recognize is that this particular situation that we're dealing with um, around COVID is that we are dealing with a crisis situation. Our most vulnerable populations are at risk. We are finding out as we're dealing with unemployment insurance, food insecurity, um, DCF um, support, that those that are supposed to be protected by our system that we as a government agency are supposed to do are not are not benefiting from this and that we have a completely broken system that we need to make sure that why we are established as a government why we are established is making sure that the most vulnerable in our population are protected they are not and that's something that's unfortunate and we have to do now from a climate perspective that's going to be the same thing that we see down the line. Uh, while we're dealing with essential social services, when it comes to the larger climate um, issues, 
it's the same thing that many of our communities and our neighborhoods are facing. So what we need to do is make sure that we have kind of this co coalescence with the groups that work with our low income communities, that work with our vulnerable populations, that work with our communities of color to make sure that we align these issues because of the fact is that when we're advocating for this, people say, oh, this is just a one-off thing. This is just, oh, you know, we got this crisis around COVID. It's a DTA issue. It's a food stamp issue. It's this, it's this. No, it's not. It's about making sure that we are protecting the most vulnerable people in our population. And what anything has exposed to any of us, um, regardless about, um, you know, regardless about the fact of the matter that we are dealing with a public health crisis, but we're dealing with a climate crisis that's going to affect so many individuals in our community. And we're dealing with this now, but it's basically giving us a pathway for the future. We need to know what we have to do for the individuals who are the most vulnerable, who are going to be the most affected by this system. In the state right now, um, we're building our systems, we have some effective things in place, but we're not prepared. Um, and that's something that as you as community members, I thank you for being here. I thank you for raising these issues because what you raise about the climate is exactly about what we're raising about economic justice, about environmental justice. And we need you as advocates here on the playing field with us. So I just wanna say thank you. I want to let you know that we are fighting with you. Um, I have an amazing uh, counselor. Uh, counselor Rivera is my, um, you know, is my city counselor. Um, so I have a, a wonderful ally. Um, Congressman McGovern's my um, congressman. And I know that the three of us are gonna be paying attention to these issues for people who are vulnerable. And we're gonna be fighting for these um, concerns um, from now until whenever this pandemic uh, ends. So I wanna thank you all for just being present, being persistent, and keeping that pressure on all of us because we need that. Um, all of the issues that we fight for are constituent driven. So if we don't hear from constituents about the concerns about food insecurity, about the concerns about environmental um, you know, concerns, about these you know, issues of economic inequality, um, that helps shape our focus. So I just wanna thank everyone here um, for you um, just to, to be raising these issues to us and just know that myself, C Councilor Rivera, and I know the Congressman, we're going to be fighting for this and we're not going to let you down and we're going to continue to be here and be in your corner. So thank you so much. Awesome, David. Thank you so much. Representative McGovern. Thank my colleague, uh, David LaBeouf and um, and uh, Sarai Rivera for their remarks and their incredible work on these issues. And, um, uh, but I also want to acknowledge uh, all of you on this call. I mean, it's a testament uh, to the resilience of the movement uh, that you're able to keep people engaged and informed uh, while organizing in person has, uh, is not an option right now. Uh, first and foremost, I, I hope that everybody is safe. Uh, I hope uh, that everybody is finding a way uh, to to adjust uh, during these really challenging times. Uh, a lot of people are struggling um, on a, and uh, with a lot of different concerns. Um, all of us are hearing uh, about them, um, not only on a daily basis, but uh, on a minute-by-minute on a minute basis. Uh, and I just wanna say to everybody uh, who's, uh, who's on the call, I mean, if my office could be of any help to any of you on any matter whatsoever during this uh, challenging time, uh, please do not hesitate to pick up the phone and call. Uh, my office, uh, like everybody else's office, offices, uh, my staff are working remotely, but we're taking calls, emails, whatever, but we're, we're here to help. You know, the, uh, the, this pandemic uh, is pulling back the curtain on several interrelated crises uh, that we have in this country right now. A crisis of leadership, a crisis of severe and growing inequality, uh, and a crisis of health inequity, uh, a crisis of environmental injustice and, and more. Um, and in many ways, we can draw parallels between the situation we find ourselves in and the climate emergency that we've been struggling to address for many, many years now. Uh, these are deeply rooted structural issues 
that uh, we have put off for way too long. Uh, some are as plain as day, uh, and some are less visible in everyday life. Uh, but with one spark, they have all converged to create a full-scale emergency. Uh, even if you thought these issues didn't have an impact on your life, all of a sudden it's clear that nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, it will be instructive to see how we come together uh, as a country to fight this virus, uh, to protect those of us who are vulnerable, uh, and create an economic recovery that works for everybody. The way we get through this should inform the way we tackle the climate emergency. You know, by the way, uh, just because we are facing this new major threat doesn't mean the climate crisis has gone away. Emissions are down uh, something like 6% this year. And in some smog-filled cities around the world, you can see blue skies for the first time in years. Uh, I saw a picture of, uh, of, a, of a city in India where you could actually see the Himalayas. Uh, but, the reduction in, uh, the, but the reduction, as we all know, is temporary, and a pandemic is not the way we want to bring emissions down. Uh, we should also remember uh, that this reduction is not just uh, a drop in the bucket compared, it, 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 it's just a drop in, the, in a bucket compared to what we need to achieve to get back to safe uh, atmospheric levels. You know, I am indebted uh, to the Sunrise Movement. Um, for the work that you have done to get the Green New Deal uh, to the forefront of the national conversation. Uh, the real question for us is not just how we keep it there, although that is important, uh, it is how to move it from a conversation piece to a cornerstone of national policy. And I agree with what Sarai has said and what uh, David has said is that, you know, we need to focus on specific actions uh, locally, uh, statewide, and, and nationally and internationally. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission in Congress. Uh, Tom Lantos was the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the United States Congress. And I've spent uh, much of my career working with my friends in the peace movement and in the human rights uh, community to bring about a more just world. And one thing I always tell them is that uh, change really takes three things. You need to show up, you need to tell stories, and you need to uh, bring a hard ask. Uh, showing up is something I don't need to tell you about. Um, you're all pros, and I have seen some incredible storytelling from Sunrise uh, in the last year and a half uh, that I think have shown the light uh, uh, on both the urgency of the movement uh, and the human cost of an action. I think you're breaking new ground uh, in the climate movement, uh, and I encourage you to keep it up. You know, bringing a hard ask is not as easy as it sounds. Um, you need to do your homework to find out uh, who actually gets to make the decisions. Uh, you need to sweat the details to know uh, how these, those specific decisions will impact people on the planet. You need, to, you need then to confront decision makers uh, with specific firm asks uh, to do uh, or not do something. And most importantly, you need to follow up and hold those people accountable once they've made those decisions. You even need to do this when people making those decisions are your friends. You know, mastering uh, those three key uh, keys is, uh, to making decision to making important change should be a priority as you look to action to take uh, in the near term, especially while we are all practicing social distancing. I hate that phrase. It should be physical distancing. Uh, we need to keep the social interactions going here. Uh, uh, learn. We need to learn about the process, and we need to lean on each other uh, to speed up and, uh, and to coordinate um, how we can hit the ground running when the, when the time is appropriate. Uh, there are opportunities uh, to make change as we speak. There's a movement now to put pressure on businesses, especially on the financial institutions, to consider the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit, rather than just uh, the last of those. Uh, and because climate advocates are showing up and telling stories and bringing hard ass, the business community is slowly waking up. Uh, for example, uh, Trump and the Republicans may want to open up the Arctic refuge to drilling, but some big, big banks are saying that they, they won't finance the drilling. Uh, if business fears public backlash uh, for bad decisions, it'll change their calculus. We need to reward those who do what we want them to do, uh, but we need to make sure people who do the wrong thing know that there is a consequence. And in Congress, even after we defeat the virus, we will need to chart a course for a just, equitable, and sustainable economic recovery. 
We need to get people back to work, maybe in jobs that didn't exist before. We need to address longstanding issues that have made uh, some people disproportionately vulnerable. We will need to rebuild our infrastructure and restore our place in the global community. And if there's any silver lining uh, to the current crisis and we are not uh, out of the woods yet, I think we're seeing that we actually can mobilize uh, in an emergency. But we will need to act decisively and creative uh, and with creativity and with courage. Uh, and you know, I think a lot of the way out of this current crisis in terms of the economy is going to be in the area of green jobs. Uh, so it sounds like uh, this is a, a prime opportunity for the Green New Deal, uh, and we will need your help to make it happen. Um, and let me just say one, one final thing. You know, this is for a lot of reasons a not only a challenging time, but it could be it could seem overwhelming. But I'm hopeful. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful um, on the issues that we care about because your movement, this movement, the Sunrise Movement, is growing in intensity, uh, and people are showing up. Uh, and it, it and it and it's a movement that includes young people and everything up to old people. Uh, so it is. It has broad broad uh, support um, and, uh, and 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 activity amongst. A wide variety of our of our community, and I, I think I think we can make a difference. I think we have to. Obviously, what happens in the upcoming elections is going to be important because whatever we do in the House, we have to get right now by Mitch McConnell in the Senate and Donald Trump in the White House. If we can remove um, McConnell and Trump, um, the opportunity for bigger, faster change is there. So I look forward to working with you. Um, Happy belated Earth Day to everybody, and thank you for so much for for inviting me here today. Thank you so much, Representative. Thank you to everyone, um, all the representatives who showed up today. Um, it's a little bit past one o'clock, but if people don't mind hanging out for another 15 minutes, I think we have most of the politicians here until about 1.15. So we're going to open it up for a short Q&A. If people want to drop some questions into the chat and then Sunrise Worcester will facilitate that way. Um, I think Sunrise Worcester would, would really like to start off with a question for you, Representative McGovern. And if it wants to trickle down to David or Sarai, that'd be great too. Um, later tonight, we're gonna have a presentation on a green stimulus proposal um, a, that was co-authored by a bunch of people essentially arguing for a green stimulus bill in response to coronavirus. Um, is that just a wish list, Congressman? Is that something we should not expect that is even practically possible with McConnell and, and Representative and, and President Trump? Um, is that just something that we're, we're really hoping for? Do you see any possibility of something like the green stimulus being passed? Well, first of all, let me just say, if you don't ask, you don't get, all right? So, I mean, um, you know, we should always um, ask for what we, we, we want, uh, if we can't get everything, hopefully we can get some of it, but if you don't ask for it, you get nothing, all right? Um, and, um, and we have some leverage uh, as we move forward, uh, those of us in the House. I mean, we're gonna have to, you know, we have some emergency uh, legislation that still needs to be passed to deal with the current crisis, to make sure we are protecting people, to invest in testing, even though the president doesn't wanna test people. Uh, we, we, need, we have hospitals that still need PPE. We need small businesses that need um, uh, uh, assistance just to be able to get through this in order to be able to uh, be able to live to see another day. Uh, but we're going to have to put together a major infrastructure package uh, to get the economy, you know, um, jump started again. So we, we have, we're dealing with emergency, you know, whole, trying to keep people whole in the short term. But then we're going to have to talk about how we recover from all this, how we how we build our economy up uh, to be strong. And I think, uh, you know, a, a green infrastructure bill, if it, even if it doesn't pass on its own, may be instructive to helping direct members of Congress, certainly in the House, to start putting some of those priorities in whatever infrastructure bill we ultimately passed. We well, ultimately pass. So I, you know, I mean, look, it is hard when you're to, 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 to be terribly hopeful when you get McConnell and Trump. I mean, they're right now trying to uh, subvert clean water, uh, the Clean Water Act and uh, clean air uh, regulations. I mean, you know, they, they haven't seen a, a uh, an environmental protection law that they haven't wanted to overturn. I get it. 
but nonetheless, I mean, you know, if they want legislation, they're going to have to make sure that those of us in the House actually, you know, move it forward as well. And so we may not get everything, but certainly I think it's worth pursuing. And look, um, you know, if, 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 if things are, are dramatically different after November uh, of this year, we're in a whole different ball game. Um, and um, so you need to lay the groundwork. Hopefully we get some of it in, a, in, a, in some of these uh, packages that we're passing. Um, and certainly we need to start building the support for uh, if things work out differently in the election for us. Thank you for that. So we have a question from the great Paul Poppenchok and Paul asks, what are possible sources of funding for the energy conversions of existing buildings? This won't be cheap, but a carbon tax could help this. So I think that's, that's sort of thrown out to anyone if anyone wants to answer that. Something that obviously needs to be put on the table. Look, I, I tell people all the time that, um, you know, we have lots of resources. We, we invest an awful lot of money, uh, you know, in tax cuts for, you know, um, big corporations. We, we, we invest an awful lot of money in building nuclear weapons uh, that I think is a total waste of money that if ever used uh, could destroy the planet. Uh, we spend an awful lot of money on things, quite frankly, that don't help lift up the quality of life for people uh, in our country or around the world. I mean, so yeah, we ought to talk about a carbon tax. And I, you know, I think that's something that absolutely needs to be put on the table. But we also have to understand, we also have you know, we also, this is a matter of priorities. I mean, what, what is our priority? And, you know, uh, I said to you, I'm on the Human Rights Commission. We talk about environmental justice as a human rights issue. Uh, you know, people having the ability to breathe clean air, to have access to clean water. Um, you know, the people be, be, live, being able to live in an area uh, where they can actually grow things to feed their populations. Those are all uh, in, in human rights issues are also important national and international security issues. So, um, you know, if we have the political will, we can find the resources. Uh, the problem up to this point has been, uh, we haven't been able to muster the political will to make the kind of dramatic changes right now that need to be made. And I think hope that that can change. I know this, the state is working on some things as well. Um, but I, I, you know, as you know, I, like I said, I support the, I, I support a green infrastructure bank as well, uh, that would help support uh, and finance green projects. That's as another way to, to provide some funding for that. Thank you, Representative. Um, if David or Sarai don't have any comments on that, I'll move to the next question. Um, and this is coming from Juji Diamondstone, the great Juji Diamondstone. Everyone's great here. Um, and Juji writes, I'm concerned about how budgetary challenges threaten climate goals, which are no less urgent than before. How can we encourage public officials to view the crisis as an opportunity to change the story from, profit, from prioritizing profits to prioritizing people and to demand creative, bold solutions? You stumped them, Juji. Good job. You stumped everyone. You want to, I, mean, I think we all probably could answer that. I mean, I, I don't want to hog the answers here, but I do think, um, uh, look, um, that's a good question because, you know, one of the arguments against, uh, you know, uh, being good stewards of our environment and dealing with issues of climate change is the people on the opposite side have been very successful, I'm sad to say, in trying to spin a narrative uh, that doesn't reflect reality. And that is that somehow, if you want to do the right thing, that it's going to be costly, that it's going to cost jobs, that taxes are going to go through the roof, that this is something we just can't afford, that you're going to have to ration your electricity and you're going to have to, I mean, it, it, all the horror stories, you're never going to be able to do this and this. You know, that's just a big fat lie. We all know that, right? We just need we, we need to make sure we get the other story out there, and that is this is about opportunity. I mean, this is about creating millions of new jobs, and at the same time, you know, protecting our planet. And um, you know, we can have both. We can have economic opportunity, and we can also 
protect our planet. I mean, they're not mutually exclusive. And the anti-environmental movement has been really persistent and, and I said to say somewhat effective um, in scaring people into believe if you want to, you know, care about the environment, then the, the, the economic costs are going to be extraordinary. The bottom line is we are, we, there are already massive economic costs. Uh, the, the, the U.S. economy pay, you know, um, uh, has, you know, has paid upward of $500 billion a year in crop damage. I mean, that's a, that's a huge cost. Um, you know, we've, it, it, we've and, and also in terms of lost labor and, ext you know, and extreme weather uh, damage, uh, this is almost double the economic blow of the Great Recession in the early 2000s. And it doesn't even account for a second or, or order cost, like the increased cost of power generation, resource shortages, and et cetera. So, I mean, doing nothing and the status quo is incredibly uh, burdensome on our budget. Um, and w again, this is, this is about persuasion and getting the truth out. And uh, we just need to be louder and more persistent than the other guys. Uh, I think that can help change kind of budgetary priorities because it creates the political opportunities, the political space for people to feel comfortable um, to move in the direction we all want them to go in. I, I agree with the Congressman. I think what he said really hit it on the money. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of times we're responding to like this narrative. Um, and as we know, we've really have, you know, so many people with these false narratives. I was actually had an opportunity to watch some documentary and was talking about kind of the, um, some of the um, radical um, evangelical, I'm very proud evangelical, but not, um, uh, not one of the, not uh, one of the crazy folks, but um, you know, thinking, you know, saying when we're actually commanded, I think so. I'm kind of putting my um, faith leader hat on. Um, we're commanded to be good stewards of this earth, right? How do we take care of an earth that was given to us, um, and that we are to take care of this earth? And we have just done such a poor job. And I feel that so much has happened has been the earth just crying out for all the damage that we've done, and. Um, and like Congressman says, we really have paid a really heavy price for it. Um, and it's been very damaging. And we're, you know, we've seen constant, like, like how long are we supposed to continue to assist? You know, we see the issue of food sustainability. Um, we've seen what happened in Puerto Rico. We've seen what happened in Haiti. We've seen what happened to many areas outside of the globe, outside of the, you know, the world and what that's cost people. Um, costing people's lives but the cost of like oh and so we get this kind of feel good and want to do and provide charity right um and and some of the things that i was watching um is that that their like um frame of mind was thinking oh we're not going to be part of this earth much longer why invest in it and we're gonna you know leave god is gonna come get us and we're gonna which is insane because actually the bible clearly talks about how you know in our beliefs that the, this earth actually belongs to us um and then we are to take care of it but that being said um just even looking at the greatest commandment of loving your neighbor and the more we continue to damage this earth we're going to continue right now you know some of the work that i'm doing um for example, in Haiti is we're trying to actually trying to create an agricultural system for food sustainability. And it's so difficult because of the way that the earth was damaged there from years of oppression, right? Um, we look at what happened in Puerto Rico and when Puerto Rico was colonized and was brought over and how they took the um, the land to just do sugarcane and what how the natives, the Tainos had actually, what they planted, what they needed, they utilized what they used, uh, they, consume the earth for what they used. And then all of a sudden, this kind of like capitalism came in through the colonization and damaged the land. And so, um, and, and we're like generations and generations and generations later, we're paying the price for it. Just look at what happened there in Puerto Rico. So um, I think it was really, I think it's really important for us to kind of take back um, the, the correct narrative and be able to say, listen, in the long run, it's going to cost us more. It's almost like when people want to do something cheaply and they buy something that's not so great and because they didn't want to spend the money and then it ends up breaking and you end up paying triple anyways because you paid for the 
cheap one and you paid for the other one. Well, the reality is that for us not investing on our earth and taking care of our earth and doing what is right and and investing in budgetary, you know, in our municipalities and our state and our federal level, that in the end is going to cost us because right now, what is it going to cost us to repair what's happening in Puerto Rico? What's it going to cost us to repair what's happening just here within our own community? The fact that we continue to um, see this level of, of food desert, what's happening to our farmers, what's happening, to, you know, how many tornadoes are going to die, how many, like, we're already at the level of exhaustion that we're going through COVID. It was a whole tornado that erupted. Um, and so, you know, that took away, like, whole communities in the last week. And so we can, you know, we have this thing, we feel good, and we raise money, and we support these communities, and then again. So I think in the long run, I think we need to see how much are we spending on all this tragedy that it's all linked in one way or another. So I think that's really important. And I think if we can take that message and I, that's why I'm so grateful. Um, and I apologize, I've been in and out, but I'm so grateful to be part of this conversation today because I really want to thank you for kind of continuing to keep this important because it's all connected. And I think now, yeah, we're all dealing with the COVID crisis, but part of this is like, I, um, what the congressman said at the beginning was so powerful that I'm trying to write it down. I think I'm going to preach that on Sunday. You know, that it's, it's helping us to expose all these things, all, you know, the, the disparity, the, the health inequities, you know, you know, the fact that how we have treated the earth um, and what that has cost us. So I think it's so important that we take advantage and, and put this information out because that then that information will will actually help to push for municipalities, um, for states and country, you know, and, and at the federal level to finance what we need to finance and be able to see the cost efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Representative McGovern. Um, it's a little bit past our time, um, but I appreciate everyone being a part of this and um, joining us for this really great conversation. I'm sure it won't be the last one that we have. Um, and it, of course, won't be the last one for Earth Day because we have more events coming up tonight. Um, so at seven o'clock, we're going to hear from our great friend, Vic Mohanka, who's going to talk about the state of Massachusetts and uh, the pending climate policy and legislation that's happening. Uh, and then at 7.30, we're going to hear from author of the Green Stimulus Letter to Congress, Thea Rio Francos, and she is going to talk about what a green stimulus entails and how it could really begin the transition um, towards a Green New Deal. So those links are all up on our Facebook, or you can go to EarthDayLive2020.org to find our local live streams. Um, and other than that, we really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. If you haven't signed in, please do that in the chat. Um, and we'll see you all hopefully at seven o'clock tonight. Mm. That was just